Hey y'all, it's Brittany and welcome back. This week we are gonna be talking about two unsolved cases. Both of these cases involve two families that both deserve justice, they deserve answers, their case deserves to be heard by the public. So we're doing just that. So if you wanna hear both of these stories and hear how you can help, stay tuned. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to everyone who has been sticking around, everyone who's already subscribed. I truly appreciate you guys. Thank you for engaging in those comments, liking videos. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those of you who are just finding my channel, welcome sis, welcome sir. Make sure you sit down and stay a while. Go ahead and hit that subscription button. Make sure you also hit that notification bell so that you get notified when I post new content. And make sure you like the video, hop in those comments, engage. This community is all about engagement and spreading the word for cases like the ones that we'll be covering today. So let's hop right into those. The first case that we're going to talk about today is the case of Elizabeth Omatara Santos. Now Elizabeth was a beautiful young woman who was currently living in Wasilla, Alaska. She was from Florida but had moved to Alaska and she had just recently broken up with her boyfriend of 10 years. His name was Dustin. So to kind of get away from all of the drama of you know a fresh breakup just to kind of clear her mind get back to her she decided that she was gonna visit a friend who happened to live in Anchorage Alaska and this friend's name was Lizette Hogland Hall now Lizette lived in Anchorage with her adult son her son's name was Desmond. He was also there at the time when Elizabeth came to visit. Now, according to police reports on August 8th of 2020, there was some sort of fight, physical altercation between Elizabeth and Lizette inside Lizette's home. Now, initially Lizette said that they fought and she admittedly lost the fight. And she said that she told her adult son to come with her and let's go hide in the bathroom to guess, I guess, to get away from Elizabeth. She didn't feel safe anymore in her home. So she claimed that she went into the bathroom, her and her adult son hid in the bathroom from Elizabeth and called the police and they waited in that bathroom until police arrived. When Lizette spoke with police, she did tell them initially that Elizabeth was unarmed and she was not seriously injured in any way. There was no blood on her. It, there was no, no indication of any severe injury. But when police arrive, they find Elizabeth who only has on a bathrobe and she's really incoherent. She's not making sense when she tries to speak. She can't really stand up. She's having a hard time getting anything out and she just seems like maybe she's under the influence of some type of drug or something that was the initial thought of the police now police also note that when they look at her upon arrival they don't notice any injuries that look like they're life-threatening or any serious injuries so it's kind of similar to what Lizette has said except for the fact that her robe was soaked in blood now as police tried to question Elizabeth and talk to her, get information from her on what was happening, what was going on. Again, she can't really speak. She can't breathe very well. She's barely able to mumble things. I think she was able to kind of give them her first name and spell it for them. But beyond that, she was not able to give them very much information at all. Now, police enter into Lizette's home and they notice that it's a mess. There is stuff everywhere. To them, it looks like there was a physical altercation that had taken place in the home. They also noted that when they went into Lizette's home, she had wiped up some of Elizabeth's blood. Now, Elizabeth was eventually put in handcuffs. She was arrested and taken to the squad car to potentially be transported to the station. As they were trying to get her to stand up, there is audio of the arrest. And you can hear them saying, we're just trying to help you down the stairs. And it just sounds like it's very hard for her to get up, to move. And she's clearly mumbling and you can't make out what she's saying. Relax, relax, relax. Elizabeth, get up. Okay. We're just gonna walk down the stairs. Ma'am. Come on, we're trying to help you. 
So they're trying to get her to the car in handcuffs while she's covered in blood and she can't breathe, she can't walk, she can't stand up, she can't speak. Now by the time they get Elizabeth arrested and down the stairs, the paramedics arrive. Now this was at about 6.45 in the morning, paramedics arrive, there are witnesses, neighbors have seen this commotion taking place this morning. Now when she got into the ambulance, she was able to tell them what hospital she wanted them to take her to. But by 7.20, she had gone into full cardiac arrest. At 6.45, she lost consciousness. Between that time and 7.20, when she actually went into cardiac arrest, I'm not quite sure why she wasn't transported in that amount of time. But right after she went into cardiac arrest, then the ambulance transported her to an emergency hospital. Now immediately upon arrival, she is rushed into surgery. The doctors discover that she has been stabbed a number of times. She's been stabbed in the abdomen, in the legs. This was not the fight that Lizette told police that it was. This was not just a normal, you know, scuffle after an argument. This was an attack. Now, after Elizabeth was transported, police did not arrest, handcuff, question really, Lizette or her son Desmond at that time. But come to find out, they actually left them at the house, which is potentially a crime scene at this point, but they were unaware at the time. They allowed them to actually unlock Elizabeth's phone and there was some activity on that phone while Elizabeth was in the hospital. But by 7.50, the doctors at the hospital are calling police to say, absolutely not. That place is a crime scene. This woman has been stabbed a number of times. This is serious and she's in critical condition. So police immediately go back to Lizette's house and at this point, they technically arrest Lizette. So we can see physically that she's getting handcuffs placed on her wrist, but they didn't put handcuffs on her son Desmond, but he was transported in a squad car to the station. So both of them were interviewed once they arrived at the station. Now, when police originally laid eyes on Lizette, she did look like she had been in a fight, a scuffle. She wasn't bleeding. There was no major injuries, but she was a little, you know, bruised, scratched, swollen, what you would expect from a tussle. Now, when police go to talk to Desmond, Lizette's son, who can be seen smirking in the back of the cop car, he immediately lawyers up. He has nothing to say. He makes no statement ever and immediately asks for a lawyer, which we know in the true crime world, that is always something that you should do. You should never talk to anybody without a lawyer present, but it didn't look good to police. However, when they talk to Lizette, she does make a statement. She says that yes, Elizabeth had come to stay with them for a few days, but she had been acting strange. She was acting odd. And this particular day on the 8th, they did get into a fight and she ended up on her back on the ground and Elizabeth was over her. And she said she managed to kind of scoot away and get away from Elizabeth. And that's when she and her son ran into the master bedroom and locked the door. And that is where they stayed until she called the police. And she said, clearly there were no injuries whatsoever on Elizabeth when she ran into that bedroom. She did claim that while they were cowering in the bedroom, her and her adult son, that Elizabeth was banging on the door, trying to break the door down as she was calling police. So as she's on the phone with 911, she's saying that Elizabeth is banging her bedroom door down. If you listen to the 911 tapes, there is none of that. There is no sound of anyone banging on anything. She then says when the police arrived, she immediately bolted out of her bedroom, passed, she assumes, passed Elizabeth and opens the door for police to let them in. She doesn't recall seeing Elizabeth, but she could have sworn that Elizabeth was upstairs still where the master bedroom was and she had run past her in some capacity. Now initially, what Lizette did not explain to police is that the first time that they left, Lizette used Elizabeth's phone to call Elizabeth's sister. Now, according to Nikki, when she answered the phone, there was just some woman screaming on the other end of the phone that Elizabeth owes her money and she has some holes in her. She needs to give me my money. She got a couple holes in her basically saying, basically saying that your sister has been stabbed because she owes me money. Nikki was still on the phone the second time that the police came 
back. And Nikki could hear them as they were interacting with Lizette. And she could clearly hear them say, she's in critical condition, she's at the hospital, we need to take you into the station. So that is literally how her family found out that she was not doing well and she had been hurt. But instead of saying, you know, we got in a fight and to defend myself, I stabbed her or whatever, Lizette goes with the story that Elizabeth did this to herself. Elizabeth stabbed herself in the legs and in the abdomen a number of times with what appeared to be a steak knife and also cut her own throat. When police ask, did you see a knife? After she initially said no, she said yes. I saw a knife, it's either on the couch or near the couch on the floor, but I saw a knife, it came from my kitchen set of knives. So when you look at this knife as it was found in the home, it's completely clean. There's no blood, nothing anywhere on this knife. Now later, Lizette did admit to calling Elizabeth's sister, Nikki, but she kind of gave a different story saying that she was more so saying that her sister was acting really strange and she didn't understand what was going on. Maybe she was on some type of drugs. Just a completely different story from what her sister Nikki said was said over the phone. Lizette also admitted to cleaning up the blood off the floor in her home, which was Elizabeth's blood. And when she was asked why, she said, oh, I was worried that it was gonna stain. I didn't want it to leave a stain. If you said that you didn't see any injuries, but now now there is blood on the floor instead of immediately wiping it up wouldn't you be more concerned with where it's coming from now at about 12 48 in the afternoon police get word from the hospital that elizabeth had unfortunately passed she had succumbed to her injuries and they communicated this to lizette when they told her this her story changed yet again desmond and i were were hiding in the room i said she i saw blood but we were hiding we i couldn't have my son and i out there like so is this after the police came or right before i called you guys yeah, you after all us. well after this happened and then i heard her in the kitchen mm -hmm. and then I, I i heard moaning and i heard the talking and stuff but i i, I just i was like baby we're staying in here till till the cops come the, I don't, I, I, I heard her banging, like I told you, it was like, she was like, uh, uh, on my doors, but I was like, no, no, like, I was like, even like, up until they rang the door, I was like, I mean, I, I, I had the door locked, but it's still, I didn't want her to like, push in through the door, they're not I that understand. sturdy of doors, so I just. <laughs> now, after they talked to both Lizette and Desmond, they took DNA samples and they took fingerprints as well and they let them both go. Even though Lizette had a violent criminal record, she was set free to go home and do whatever she pleased. Now police do some investigative work and they talk to friends of Elizabeth's who had recent contact with her in the days leading up to this specific incident. And they do find a couple of people who said, I talked to her during that time. She a never used drugs, she didn't use drugs, and B, she was fine. She was not acting strange in any way. She was not acting odd in any way. She was completely fine. And furthermore, she was not upset. She was not sad, she was not depressed because she had recently broke up with her boyfriend. So she had no reason to have stabbed herself or tried to take her own life. But Lizette carried on that same story. As soon as she was released, she started telling people that Elizabeth stabbed herself along with a number of different other versions of the story. It never stayed the same. There was never a consistent story from Lizette, according to those that spoke with her. Now, police also come across a friend who claimed to be a witness. She claimed that she was a friend of Elizabeth's, but she was on the phone with Lizette at the time that this incident took place. And she said to the police that this was not Elizabeth that did this to herself. She did not do this to herself whatsoever. Then she went on to say she was also on the phone with Elizabeth at about 3 a.m. that morning but when police went to go check records she was not on the phone with Elizabeth at 3 in the morning. There was no such call. So this friend also flipped and started to push this suicide story after police found out that she was never on the phone with Elizabeth. So with all the changing stories this witness was not 
credible in any way. But there was actual evidence, physical evidence via text messages that Elizabeth has sent to friends saying, you know, right around that time that this event took place, she was out walking her dog and she was helping Lizette clean up her house because it was a mess and different things of that nature. Now, mind you, when police arrived on the scene, they thought the mess was from the altercation. But if the house was already messy, was there an actual altercation that took place? They can also see that she had tried to call and text her ex-boyfriend and she was basically begging him to answer the phone. And I don't know if this is something that took place during the attack or her being hurt or stabbed and maybe asking for help, reaching out to anyone she can for help. And maybe that's how Lizette got into possession of her phone. But there is evidence of some activity around this time where she was coherent during this specific time on this day. Since then, the investigation into this case was suspended. Police just stopped investigating the case and the case has now been closed according to APD as of October of 2020. Now this happened August 8th of 2020 and by October of the same year, the case was suspended and closed. How in just two months are you comfortable with closing a case such as this one? A case where a woman who is bleeding profusely, her clothing that she has on it when police arrived is soaked, but you have the other participant in the altercation saying there were no injuries whatsoever when I saw her. She stabbed a number of times when she arrives at the hospital. The person that is in the altercation, her story has changed a number of times. She went from saying, nope, I never saw any blood. I never saw any injuries on Elizabeth to, oh yeah, wait, no, I did see blood and I told my son about it, but I was too afraid to go help her, which again makes no sense if she did this to herself because if she did this to herself you would have witnessed her doing it to herself if you saw blood before you ran but the case was actually never ruled a homicide it was never formally ruled a suicide either but it's just not being investigated which is completely unfair to elizabeth and elizabeth's family and again they did collect dna they collected fingerprints they collected the knife that was on the scene they tested none of it, none of it. They never tested the knife. They never tested any evidence that was collected on the scene in this case, and they refuse. There has been push by the family for them to just test it. If she stabbed herself and that's the knife she used, her fingerprints should be on there. Now the family has also reached out to the media in Alaska a number of times, just asking for any type of coverage, any type of interest to be shown in their family member's case and they just refuse to do so. It's not important. It's not important enough to them to cover such a case when it should be something that's just as important as anything else that is happening because it just makes no sense. It makes no sense to me that someone will wanna kill themselves after they just won a fight. They won the fight and then they begin to attack themselves. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. And it's so unfair, the family's treatment that they have received. It's completely unfathomable and unfair. So I wanted to make sure to share the information here. If you are in the area or were in the area or know someone or know anything, even if you feel like it does not make sense, if you feel like it's not important, it's insignificant, you never know what may help to break a case to bring some new life into a case, especially one that's happened just in the past few years. I would encourage you to share any information that you have regarding the case of Elizabeth Santos. If you want to reach out anonymously, you can definitely do so, but reach out to the Anchorage Police Department and share whatever you have. Her sister has also set up a petition for the case to be continued to be investigated. So I'll leave the link in the description box of that petition as well. So if you feel so moved, please sign the petition to help to bring more awareness to the case of Elizabeth Santos. Now, the second case that I wanted to talk to you about is the case of Barry Harris. Now, Barry Harris was also known as DJ Dragon Cuts, and he was unfortunately attacked and murdered on February 28th of 1997 in Baltimore, Maryland. This was over 25 years ago. 
and this case is so heartbreaking. Barry was a security guard at Rite Aid during the day, but he was a DJ that was growing his career by night. He worked for the radio station 92Q and also V103 and then he also DJed at clubs and did you know smaller gigs like parties and things like that as well. And right around the time of the attack he had just got ready to start this new venture that was going to really help to grow his career as a DJ with a club by the name of Club Raven that he had already been doing gigs with prior to that point. But he was right on the verge of starting this great new venture that was supposed to be extremely promising for his DJ career. Now Barry was not just a security guard or a DJ, he was also a husband and a father. And on this night, on the 28th, his wife and his four daughters were in bed sleeping he was out doing his night gig, so they were in the bed sleeping as they should have been. And about midnight or so, there is a loud banging on their door. Now, the mother wakes up, answers the door, and his oldest daughter, Autumn, who was nine at the time, recalls the next events that took place after that. She recalled that they opened the door and the next thing she knew, her mother was rushing her and her siblings to the neighbors, to the next door neighbor's house. And she heard her mother say, keep them away from the news and keep them away from the TV. And then she left. Now, unfortunately, what happened that night was Barry was DJing at Club Raven that night and they were closing down early because business was slow. So he had packed up his records. He was getting ready to go home and he was walking on the sidewalk, leaving the club at the time. And as he was walking down that sidewalk, he was shot in the back. Now he was transported to a nearby hospital, but unfortunately he passed due to his injuries. Barry was only 32 years old, leaving behind his wife and his four young daughters, which is so hard to think about because four daughters losing their father at such a young age, fathers are so important to children's lives, especially in their youth. So it's really hard to think about them not having their father. And then these girls growing up to be beautiful women who have their own children now and he never got to see his grandchildren. Autumn, who's his oldest daughter, is now 34 and she has three daughters of her own, London, Dior, and Callie. Adrian has four children, Ariana, Princeton, Rylan, and Ryan. His daughter, Arielle, who's 30, has two boys, Cole and Roman. And he also left behind his fourth daughter who's also 30, Ashley. Now since the beginning of this case over 25 years ago, there has never been any valuable leads. There have never been any suspects in this case. There has never been any evidence to help police to solve his case in any way, unfortunately. There have been rumors about what happened that night, People have called the radio station that he worked at and someone said it was a family member who attacked him. Other people said it was a friend, a close friend of his that did it. But police really believe that it was probably a robbery gone wrong. And if it was a robbery gone wrong, it was for a very small amount of money. He was said to have about $5 on him at the time. But again, this family is looking for our help, for your help, for anyone that you know, if anyone in the area or who was in the area at the time or knew someone, if you have any information whatsoever about Barry Harris and what happened to him on that night back in 1997, please, please contact Baltimore Police Department. Nothing is too small, nothing is too insignificant to share. This family really deserves closure. This family deserves healing. And Autumn, who is a wonderful, wonderful human being, has been working so hard to push and keep her father's story out there. No matter how old she gets, that wound will never heal for any of his children. I'm sorry. <laughs> We've been waiting. We have been waiting for somebody to say something. <laughs> Come next month, it'll be 25 years. And I know I know somebody knows something. It would mean so much. And not saying that we'll move on with our lives, but when somebody is taken away and that's a good person, you want to know why would somebody do that? You would really want to know why. I don't even know if somebody called tonight. I, I'm lost for words. I wouldn't even know what to say. I would be happy, but 
it's still you can't bring them back so please reach out again you can share any information that you have anonymously you don't have to identify yourself but any piece of information will help to reignite the case to finally give this family some closure and allow them to begin to heal all right you guys so those are the two cases that i wanted to share with you today i am sending so much love so much light and so many prayers to the families of barry harris and elizabeth santos as well again if you know something say something somebody knows something and these families deserve answers they deserve closure and they deserve the opportunity to begin to heal in any way that they can so please make sure you like this video please make sure you share this video continue to spread the word on these cases because the media really doesn't cover cases like these and these families are fighting so hard to keep their family members names out there in in people's ears so please make sure you share this video I would greatly appreciate it as would their families and before I go I wanted to update you guys on one of our sponsors and that is Skillshare so I told you guys last go around that I was trying out a couple of classes on Skillshare. I have really been enjoying the self-care playbook with Jonathan Van Ness so far. You know that I really wanted to take part in the classes that Skillshare has to offer because I am trying to be a better me personally and also to bring better content to you guys, which they have some great content on how to better your skills, whether you're a photographer, whether you are a content creator like myself or things like self-care whether you just want to make time for yourself and make it more valuable for you but i've really been enjoying the classes so far skillshare is an awesome platform that really allows you to hone your skills in whatever category it may be they are always adding new classes new subjects so it's a wealth of information and the first 1000 people to join via my link will get one month free access of skillshare's platform so learn a new skill better your skills improve your personal life self-care is very important whatever you want to do sis or sir make sure you do it with skillshare check out the link below to get one month free access all right you guys it's been really real this week i was so privileged to have two families reach out to me and ask me to share their stories on my platform i feel so humbled thank you for giving me the opportunity to share and spread the word i love you guys until next time, bye.